Greetings citizens. Hey you, hey you beautiful creepy little human being you. Welcome to my channel and welcome to today's morbid makeup video. I'm so happy we can meet like this. I'm so happy that in all of this craziness somehow today you and I were able to find each other on this crazy little planet that we call home. My name is Brittany or Bratterstein, whichever you prefer, and today we're going to be discussing the murder of Jason Fox. Jason Fox was a 19 year old man from Washington who went missing in September of 2020. So just a couple of months ago now when I'm, when I'm filming this, it's a more recent case. And sadly, a few weeks after he went missing, his body was discovered buried in a shallow grave. But before we get started, if you have not yet had the pleasure, please make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing the bell. I put out a new morbid makeup video every single week and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically used to do it. Go ahead and like do those things and join us and become one of us. One of us, one of us, one of us. So now that I'm done with that pesky but totally necessary self-promotion, we can get into this case. Now this case was actually suggested to me by a subscriber named Kristen. Hi Kristen, thank you for your suggestion. Anyways, when I saw this suggestion um, in a comment under one of my other videos, I went and I Googled his name and as soon as I Googled his name and I started looking into his case, I found myself wanting to stop what I was doing and like really like dive into his case. Um, and so I did and I found from, from Kristen, his mother's TikTok page. She has a TikTok page and a Facebook page. They're both dedicated to Jason and his case and trying to get justice for Jason. And you know, and it, it, it just like got me. I fell very hard into it. I started watching all of her videos and scrolling through all of her Facebook because I just felt like so, so sad for her. And I felt her pain to some extent anyway, obviously I can never feel that because I haven't experienced that, but it got me, you know? So due to his mother, his mother's name is Pepper, due to her promotion and like getting all the word out on TikTok, his case is pretty, pretty well represented on TikTok. But when I looked on YouTube, I found that there are like hardly any case. I think there was one video on his case. So I was like, okay, I need to sit down. I need to do a video so that he can also be represented on this platform for those who watch YouTube over TikTok, which I, I know a lot of people do. So that's why I wanted to make this video. I wanted to put out into the world what I think should exist. So that's what I'm doing today. So come gather around and let me tell you the story of the horrible murder of Jason Fox. So let's start with the most basic question. Who was Jason Fox? Jason Fox was one of two sons. Him and his brother Robbie were born to parents Michael and Pepper Fox. Michael and Pepper divorced when Jason was just a small child and he and his brother Robbie ended up spending most of their childhoods living with their father Michael until Jason was about seven years old and this is when his father remarried to his new stepmother Susan. Jason was a magnetic and caring person with a smile that could light up a room and he was really interested in art and theater growing up and I think it's probably safe to say that from a young age Jason knew that he was gay and his older brother said that he would do whatever he could to kind of fit in because of this area that they grew up in was he said and I quote in Newport which is where which is where they grew up if you did not do sports or something like that you were not popular so Jason tried his hand at being a DJ for the school radio he joined the wrestling team he did whatever he could to kind of find his way and fit in with all the other kids, teenagers, people in his peer group. Jason had a lot of friends growing up, but he also had his fair share of bullies, but Jason wasn't the type of kid to like take being bullied lying down. So he'd come home after being in a, in a fight and he'd be beaten and bruised, but he wouldn't be crying or feeling bad for himself because he didn't stand there and take it. He was beaten and bruised because he stood up and, and fought back against the people who were trying to attack him and abuse him and bully him. He was just like a strong kid who stood his ground and was like, you know what? I'm not gonna let you just hit on me. I'm gonna hit on you back. When Jason came out as gay to his family when he was a teenager, they, they weren't exactly surprised. They seemed like the perfect type of family you would wanna have in this situation since sometimes, you know, we hear stories about parents who are just like complete shitheads about things like that, but they were just like, thanks for the information, but like we already know and it literally makes no difference at all. So they seemed like a, like a pretty good family and like a tight, they seem to love each other, which is good and also heartbreaking for considering what happened with Jason. Shortly after coming out to his family and right before his senior year, Jason decided that he wanted to go and move with his biological mother, Pepper, in Seattle, partly because he and Pepper hadn't gotten to spend as much time together as either of them would have liked throughout his life growing up. So he wanted to go and reconnect with her. And also 
because he felt that Seattle would be a more progressive, accepting place for him to go and live and be able to be himself and be just open and gay and not have to worry about the homophobes and bigots who are going to give him trouble for just trying to live his life and do his thing and mind his own business. Because sadly, while he was living in Newport, he had come out to his family as like being full on gay, but he told his friends and people who lived in Newport, like the general public that he knew, that he was just bi because he thought that that would be better accepted. He felt like he needed to kind of tone down who he was to be accepted, which is just so sad. But we know that places like this exist and people like this exist. They shouldn't. I don't get it, but they do. From what I read online, it seems like Newport isn't the most progressive place. I've never been there, so I'm just going off of what they say. Jason was right about Seattle, though, because once he moved there, he seemed to flourish, and he seemed like a, like he was becoming a happier person. Jason made friends easily, and he started going to parties with kids his own age, and he just seemed to be doing super well. But unfortunately, while in Seattle, his grades started to drop, and maybe this is because he had a social life now, so he wasn't focusing as much on school. Maybe it was something else, but because of this, he didn't have enough credits to graduate. So, so because of him not having enough credits to graduate and the fact that he was just kind of starting to get homesick, he missed his brother, he missed his dad, he missed his family, he ended up moving back to Newport to finish the rest of his credits in Newport where he could just like focus on school. And he was just really determined to finish school. He wanted to, he had a plan for his life. He wanted to be a nurse. After he was done with school, he wanted to go to college to be a nurse because he really just wanted to help people and he really cared about other people. Things started to go downhill for Jason once he returned to Newport. You see, the issue is like most small towns in America, Newport had a bit of a drug issue. There were drugs kind of everywhere and uh, meth in particular. And Jason admitted to his father that he had tried meth. And in response to this, his father kicked him out of the house that summer. He's like, you're not gonna do this in my house, you need to go. He's an adult, Jason was an adult. That's something that a lot of parents, you know, don't tolerate, so he was out. So during that time, Jason was bouncing around from house to house, just kind of couch surfing. And his mother, Pepper, back in Seattle told him like, you can come and you can stay with me, I don't mind. But Jason didn't want to go back to Seattle. He didn't want to leave Newport again. He didn't want to leave his friends that he had made in Newport again. Things were going like not great for him on the street though. And he admitted to his mother, Pepper, that he had actually been raped by a man while he was living out on the street and bouncing from place to place. And Pepper reasonably freaked out. She's like, what the hell? Like, you need to go to the police. And you need to report this because he hadn't reported it. And he told her he would. But according to the police, since we now know more information now that, you know, sadly, he's he's been killed. He never reported this to the police, according to the police. After a bit of time, Jason's family realized that he may need a little help getting back on track. He had all these plans and things he wanted to do with his life and his family was realizing that while he was out on the street, he was likely just using drugs since he had no supervision to stop him from doing so. So they decided that in an effort to kind of help him get his life back on track, that he would go and stay with his older brother, Robbie, until he started college. That was until Jason started college because Jason was going to be enrolling in the Spokane Falls Community College. At Robbie's place, he had set up a little room, like a little place just for Jason with a bed and a TV. And he said that while Jason stayed there with him, it was like the best their relationship had ever been. And they had moved from that phase of just being brothers to also being friends. And that's a thing that in my experience does happen when you become adults with your siblings, maybe not with all people, but it definitely happened with me and my sisters. So though it's so sad what happened to Jason, I'm really like happy for Robbie that he got to have that experience because it honestly is a really great feeling, but I'm sure it just made it that much harder to, to lose his brother, which is just heartbreaking. Unfortunately though, this little situation didn't last long. And after only a week, Jason told his brother that he didn't want to stay there anymore. He didn't want to be an inconvenience. He wanted to go back to Newport. So he left, but he promised his brother that he would come back and visit him the following month. And that was going to be September of 2020, the month that he ended up going missing. So just a few days prior to Jason's planned visit to go back and see his brother Robbie on September 14th, 2020, 19-year-old Jason Fox picked up his friend, a 25-year-old man named Claude Merritt, and the two took a short drive to Timber River Ranch. 
a place less than 15 minutes from Newport, which was this nice green area with a barn, a place that was often used as a wedding venue or to take photos because of the gorgeous nature. It was very green and lush and you have to drive into a little bit of a secluded area deep in the trees to even get there. Jason was a little apprehensive about this meeting, however, because he was worried that another man, a 26 year old man named Riley Hillstad, might be there because he knew that he had been living on the property. And if Riley was there, Jason did not want to go. We have text messages to see this and Jason was basically like, look, dude, I want to hang out with you. You're my bud. Like I want to go and I want to have fun, but I don't want to go if Riley's there. I don't want to deal with the drama that comes with this guy. And his friend Claude basically said like not to worry, he wouldn't be there and said, and I quote, I don't like that shit around me. And that comment right there was one of the very first things I read about this case. And it stuck out to me because when I was first presented this case, when I first, you know, came upon Pepper's TikToks and things like that and posts on his Facebook page, I thought it was just strictly a really fucked up random gay bashing. And don't get me wrong, it may very well have been motivated by Jason's sexuality. What happened to him may have been motivated by Jason's sexuality. These guys might have been like, F gay guys. You know, we see it. It happens. But when I read that comment, that was the first time something popped in my head that I was like, oh, I wonder if there's anything drug related in this. It immediately set off that alarm in my head. And that was before I had looked further into the case and learned that drugs did play a part in this case before I learned that Jason did play around with meth a little bit. And, and we'll find out about these guys a little later down the line that actually are, were arrested for hurting Jason, for hurting Jason, for killing Jason, that they also dipped their toes in the drug scene as well. So Jason did agree to go, but he clearly felt like something was off because he sent a text message to his cousin that simply read 22 Jurgens road, just in case anything happens to me. This was the last time anyone in Jason's family would speak to him. And when he didn't show up back home, because I believe he was living with this cousin at the time, a missing persons report was filed. As soon as Jason's mother, his biological mother, Pepper, heard that Jason was missing, she paid, she prepaid for a few months in her Seattle home. She moved up to Newport. She got a hotel room to, and hunkered down and plastered the walls with photos of her missing son, Jason. So three days later, three days after Jason had gone missing, police showed up at 22 Jurgens Road on September 17th, 2020, because they had looked into his cell phone records and found that his phone had pinged at this location right after midnight on the night that he went missing. And also, I mean, there was a text of him saying that that's where he was going to be. Each person who was at this property told police something different about the last time they had seen Jason Fox. Claude Merritt, the guy who Jason had been texting with, the guy who drove to the property with Jason, well, he told police he hadn't seen Jason in two weeks. Riley Hillstad, the guy that Jason was worried about being there, said for him, it had been at least a month since he had seen Jason. Another man at the property, a 28 year old man named Matthew Raditz Freeman said that Jason knew better than to come out to that property and he hadn't been there in at least two months. And this man's girlfriend who was also at the property said that Jason had actually been there only a week ago and had to have been escorted off the property. There was one other man that was questioned, a 24 year old man named Kevin Belding. I couldn't find clarity on whether or not he lived at the property with the other people who were there, or if he was just there the night of the, the murder of Jason, but he was, he was somebody who police were talking to and who was there at least at the time that Jason was killed. Less than a week later, Jason's vehicle was found outside of Libby, Montana. And when traced phone records showed that Matthew Raditz Freeman's phone was in the same place after Jason disappeared. So he just happened to be in the same place as Jason's car. Jason's missing Jason's GPS shows that he was at this farm and everybody's claiming that nobody has seen him. Seems very believable. Like I think they're telling the truth, right? Totally. So police ended up coming back out to the farm to press the men further. Cause they're like, okay, this doesn't make any sense. Your stories that aren't adding up. And when pressed, these men changed their stories. Go figure. Now they were saying that Jason was at the property on the 15th. Oh, really? Now you remember? Okay. 
And they said that while there, Jason had gotten to a fight, an altercation with Matthew Raditz Freeman. And when they realized that it seemed like the fight was going to be physical, Claude Merritt intervened, got between them and broke it up. They say that Jason then left in a silver car and the men followed him off the property just to ensure that he was actually gone. So police obviously wanted to search this property. That is not the right highlighter. As I was saying, police obviously wanted to search this property, but I don't know if it was because the men who were living there wouldn't give them permission. I couldn't find clarity on this point or if police were just apprehensive to do so because these men were not the owners. So what they ended up doing was going over these young men's heads. They ended up going to the source and spoke to the actual owner of the property. This was a woman named Shannon and she gave them permission to do their search. So police showed up to search the property on October 2nd, 2020. And when they got there, the first thing they saw that was definitely suspicious is there was like a trail on the property. And on this trail, they found a pill bottle that had Jason's name on it. And as they, you know, followed that trail further, they then found a pair of black sunglasses that were broken and missing a lens. So they were like, this is starting not to look good. And as they kept going, the trail led to this clearing and on the clearing, there were two boats. One of the boats was like up on a platform, but one of them was on the ground. And when they looked at this grounded boat, they saw that there was fresh gravel and there were tire tracks that seemed to lead to and from that boat. So police were like, okay, we should probably look into this. <sighs> Two days later on October 4th, 2020, police showed back up at the property with a backhoe and they started to dig below where that second boat was. And this is when they uncovered Jason's body. He was buried in a shallow grave with his hands bound behind his back. When interviewing Matthew's, Matthew Raddett Friedman's girlfriend, she told police that on the night that Jason had disappeared, she had woken up in the night to the sound of a skid steer being unloaded from a trailer. And then that skid steer was operated on the property around where Jason's body was found for about 30 minutes. Apparently after that, Riley and Matthew both left in their cars to Montana. Spoiler alert, one of those cars was Jason's vehicle. Allegedly, allegedly. In investigating these men further, they also found that Riley Hillstad had received a very interesting message on social media on September 24th of 2020, and it read, and I quote, you need to explain what happened and be a better man, dude. You can't just hide what you did to that 19 year old kid. Nearly two months after Jason's murder on November 7th, 2020, police finally brought in Riley Hillstad to the police station for an interview. And this guy, this guy, apparently Riley showed up to the interview wearing a ballistic vest, pepper spray, handcuffs, knives, an AR-15 and a handgun to a police interview. And court documents say that during this interview, Riley told police that he should have killed the owner of 22 Jurgens Road when he had a chance. Which is like a really weird thing to say when you're being interviewed by police. I don't know. That's probably not what I would lead with, but go off Riley Hillstead. No, no, no attempt to conceal what he had done or what type of person he was. During this interview, he also admitted to driving the skid steer that night and to transporting Jason's car to Montana. But he was like, that's it. I did not have anything to do with killing him or covering up his body. Which is weird because I think like the skid steer was used to hide the body, but okay. So initially these four men could not keep their story straight on what happened, who was involved and in what capacity. But eventually three of the four men, Matthew, Kevin and Claude, all turned and pointed their finger at Riley Hillstad saying that everything was his idea. He was the perpetrator. He came up with the alibi. He's the one who beat Jason. He's the one who took Jason outside alone, bound him with his hands behind his back, killed him and buried him. All of it was Riley. Now, who were these men? The connection there is a little bit complicated, but I'm going to do my best to make this as comprehensive and understandable as possible. So while Jason was doing his couch surfing during that summer that he had been kicked out of his father's house, that is when he met 28 years old, 28, 28 years old, 28 year old, 28 year old Matthew Radins Friedman, and they had become buddies. So he ended up moving in with Matthew and Matthew's girlfriend, and they were living together for a little bit of time. But then the three of them all moved out of the, the home that they shared 
and Jason went back to couch surfing, finding out wherever he could stay, while Matthew and his girlfriend both moved to the Timber River Ranch property, the place where Jason was inevitably murdered, and they moved in with a friend, Riley Hillstead. Also, side note, I didn't even mention it, but these three, Riley, Matthew, and his girlfriend, they didn't even have the right to live on this ranch. They were straight up squatting on the property. Apparently, this property belonged to a couple, a married couple named Ken and Shannon. And Shannon's the one who ended up giving police, you know, the right to search the property in the first place. Well, apparently this place used to be poppin', like weddings. That was a whole shebang there. But in the last couple of years, it had slowed down. And then COVID happened and like the business just wasn't doing super well. And in addition to that, Ken and Shannon ended up getting divorced. And Shannon ended up being given full custody. I don't know the right word for this. She was the one who got the property in that divorce. And she had not been there in a while. So a few days before Jason was killed, she had actually showed up at the property with her attorney because they were going to do some inventory on what was there for, you know, her divorce. That's the thing you do, splitting assets, all that jazz. And when she got there, she just found all these freaking losers living on her property. So she gets there and like there's a um, house that's on the property like next to a river and she goes and she knocks on the door with her attorney and Riley Hillstead answers the door with a couple of guns on his belt. And she's like, are you doing in my house? Who are you? What is going on? And he's like, don't worry. Everything's chill. Ken gave me permission to be here. This is where I live now. And apparently, side note, this isn't true. According to Ken, you know, Shannon's ex-husband, he and his attorney say that these people were just squatting there and that they actually also stole a bunch of money from Ken. And now they have like a separate lawsuit against them that's unrelated to this. But I just want to give you some backstory that these guys were just loser squatters who were just living on this property and then it ended up doing this terrible thing and it wasn't even like their place. Not like that matters, but I read that when I was looking into this case and I thought you'd want to know. That's all. That's it. Okay, moving on. So back to Jason and his connection with these guys. Well, apparently by the summer of 2020, the relationship between Jason, Matthew, and Riley was not good. And I couldn't find clarity as to why exactly. But Jason ended up calling police in June of 2020 and telling them that J uh, that, uh, that Matthew had swung a pipe at Jason's car during an altercation. And I believe this altercation was over money just on like deductive reasoning, you know, because after Matthew did this, Jason gave money to Matthew's girlfriend. The following month, both Matthew and Riley had gone to Jason and broke the windshield of his car, just like bashed it in. And apparently this was because it, for some reason, and I couldn't find out why Jason would have done this, he took the license plate off of Riley's car. And during this altercation, Riley brandished a gun and was talking about murdering Jason. And one thing that I couldn't get clarification on that just is making my head crazy and makes my head spin because I want to give that information to you and I want to have that information for myself was how Claude and Kevin fit into this whole mix. Because I don't believe that they lived on the property with Matthew, Riley, and Riley's girlfriend and Claude at least to Jason was seen as a friend was seen as somebody he trusted. He trusted him enough to go out to that property with him. And I don't know how Claude fits in with Riley and Matthew. And I want to know, and it makes me crazy, but this case is very new. It just happened last year. The arrests just happened. We have to kind of wait for the trial to happen for more stuff to come out, but I couldn't find that information and I want it. I want it. All four men, 26 year old Riley Hillstad, 28-year-old Matthew Raditz Freeman, 25-year-old Claude Merritt, and 24-year-old Kevin Belding were arrested and charged with first-degree murder in connection with Jason's death. Riley Hillstad was charged with nine counts, including first-degree murder and first-degree kidnapping, and was given a $1 million bond. He was brought into the courtroom in shackles because he was considered a danger to the court. Kevin Belding was charged with first-degree murder, first-degree kidnapping, and giving police false or misleading statements, and his bail was set for $750,000. Claude Merritt was also charged with first-degree murder, first-degree kidnapping, and making false or misleading statements to police, and his bail too was set for $750,000. And Matthew Raditz Friedman was charged with first-degree murder, first-degree kidnapping, second-degree taking a vehicle without permission, tampering with physical evidence, and making false or misleading statements to police, and his bail, like the other two, were set for $750,000. Apparently there was another man arrested named Sean Bella. I could find literally no information about him and his connection to the case, unfortunately, but he was arrested because apparently he was there and didn't try to stop it, didn't tell police what happened. And he was charged with giving police false or misleading statements, which I wish I had more information on him. 
he's a mystery. Who is Sean Bella? I do not even know. I'm so sorry for that. I might have to do an update video like later in the future with updates on cases that I'm leaving like pending because we have a couple right now. But I mean, with a new case and them not letting out information, like I'm just giving you what I have here. Now, what exactly happened to Jason is unclear. What caused the attack on him, why these men decided they needed to murder him is unclear. And since they gave so many different stories about what happened, it's hard to make an exact determination, but one fact that remained clear and consistent through their statements is that Jason was tied to a chair and beaten prior to being killed, which is just horrible. His cause of death was blunt force trauma to his head. And then after death, he was buried in a shallow grave. It was about three or four feet into the earth with his hands bound behind his back. According to witness statements and social media records, Riley Hillstad knew how to operate and had access to a skid steer, which is what I mentioned earlier that Matthew's girlfriend heard being operated in the area that Jason was found buried. And I had to Google what a skid steer was because you know, I live in Southern California and I've never uh, lived that life. And apparently it's like a, like a tractor, but like with the big shovel on the front. Let me know if I'm wrong. My mom grew up on a farm and she would just be like, dumb little bitch. Like sh I should know. I don't know. I'm sorry. Now there is the question as to whether or not this was a hate crime due to Jason being a gay man. Now, police have not come out and said that it was, they haven't admitted if any homophobic things were said by these men in interviews and they haven't determined what the motive was specifically, but Pepper, Jason's mother believes wholeheartedly that this was a hate crime. Now, if you remember, Jason said that he had been raped and police have his diary apparently, and they've looked into it and they've seen that Jason did write about a sexual assault, but they said, and I quote, it does not provide a level of detail to prove that Jason was assaulted, but they are still looking into it and seeing if somehow this could be connected to his death. Police are obviously also exploring the drug aspect because they have said, well, they don't know specifically if it was related or they're not telling us specifically if it was related. We do know that Jason had dabbled in drugs and we do know from court records that these men, all of the men involved were involved in drugs in general. And police have just said that they have much more information than has been released so far, but the crime is still very, or excuse me, the investigation is still very active. So they urge patience. And that is the latest on this case. Really? That's all we know for now until a trial starts and everything's just kind of up in the air. And I can't even imagine how hard that is for his family to not know the why, which ugh, like knowing how is something and it's horrible, but I feel like knowing why is so important to like, I don't know. I feel like nothing will ever be a justified reason, but I can't imagine the not knowing. It just to me seems like such an impossible thing to deal with, to just sit there and wonder why, why did my son end up in a hole? Why did these men decide to murder my baby and take him from the world forever? Jason's mother, Pepper advocates for her son on social media. She started doing this when Jason was only missing posting on TikTok and Facebook, and she has been incredibly vocal and involved in her son's disappearance. She has spoke to everyone involved, including the four men arrested and to Jason's drug dealers looking for answers. She did all of this when Jason was still just missing and wanted to try to find where he was. So she was like, listen, I know you sell my kid drugs. Do you know where he is? Which is like a brave thing to do quite, quite frankly. I've seen online that the social media thing is a little bit of like an odd topic in the family and not everybody agrees with the way that Pepper is handling her grief and posting so much online. But I, I'm sure that this helps Pepper cope with her loss and it's helped get his case out there and get people talking about it and knowing about it, which is important. It just is important. Like there, there have been arrests now, but just having that backing is important in a lot of ways and helpful. I imagine for helping the family not feel so alone. And I have to imagine that it helps give her some sort of happiness or I don't know if happiness is the word, but just being able to do one last thing for her son. She has said, and I quote, there's people who think that I'm strong. I feel like I've lost my mind. I miss my baby so much. I think people are mistaking a gal who has nothing left to lose for someone who is brave. I want to know the truth. I want justice. People ask me for help now because they think I'm brave. I'm not. I'm just a nobody who lost her kid. 
Jason's older brother, Robbie, copes by just trying to remember Jason. Apparently he keeps like a bag of Jason's clothes next to a hope chest that's just filled with all of Jason's stuff from when he was growing up, stuffed animals and things like that. And occasionally when he'll like think of him and really miss him, he'll just take an item out and just sit with it on the couch. And I just find that to be really sad and sweet. And Robbie said of this, and I quote, sometimes I just put my head down there and fall asleep on the couch. That's what helps me. Jason's father, Michael, said, and I quote, it's real nice to see that the guys that hurt my son are behind bars, but nothing ever brings him back. And the last quote I'll give you is one from Jason's stepmother, which is probably what I would say in a situation like this, and it is. The thing that I think has helped us the most is knowing that these assholes have been arrested. And that's just sort of it. You know, I know that there's some tension between Pepper and her ex, Michael, and his new wife, Susan. I did see some conversations, some confrontations on Facebook when I was researching this case. And I just find it to be really sad. Like these people are going through the hardest thing that anyone should ever have to go to. So I don't think it's unreasonable that tensions will be high and everyone feels and grieves differently. And they're all hurt and all of their feelings are valid. And I think it's fine that they don't see eye to eye. I don't think they have to. I just hope that they can all find some peace after what they've gone through because it's just awful. And that, my friends, is the story of the murder of Jason Fox. What do you think? What do you, what do you think happened? Do you think it was drug related? Do you think it was a hate crime? Do you think it was a combination, a little A, a little B, or do you have a completely different theory bouncing around in your head based on the information that I've given you? For me, if I'm honest, just based on the information that I have, and I'm not trying to be disrespectful at all, it's just based on what I have, I'm leaning towards the drug thing just based on the way he was killed, the way he was attacked, things that happened leading up to it, just what I know, that's how I lean. But that's clearly subject to change as more information comes out because honestly, it could just as easily been a freaking homophobic bullshit hate crime because people suck, clearly. I'm eager for the trial to start. I'm eager to hear what these men have to say if they're gonna tell what happened and actually why, I feel like with that many players, we might get something from somebody. And I just hope that it's the truth. And I hope that, I hope that we just find out because I really want to know what, why this happened. Cause it's just so sad and pointless. Like I didn't know Jason obviously, but just looking at photos of him, he just looks I, like, I feel like I could have easily known him, you know? And like, like when I was younger, he just looks like the friends that I had and he just looked happy and it's just, up that people do things like this. I just feel so bad for Jason and his family having to go through this. And then, oh, and I didn't even tell you, which makes it so much worse. Like when you're already going through something sad. So they had set up a little memorial outside for Jason. You know, you see these little candles, stuffed animals, photos of Jason, just something in, in place for him where people can go and drop things off and show, you know what I'm talking about. Well, some absolute assholes went and vandalized this and wrote some like homophobic slurs. Who does that? Who raised you? Be better, that's so fucked up. I did also read that Pepper wants to one day build a home in Newport that would be safe for anyone who identifies as LGBTQ. She just wants there to be a space where these people can feel protected and accepted and to make sure that something like this never happens again, which is a noble cause. I wish, I wish that things like this would never happen again. I doubt that they, like, they will always happen because people will always suck but if she could help even one person, like that's worthy. You know what I mean? I don't know, man, it's just really sad and I wish it didn't happen and that's such an obvious statement, but that's just, it's true and that's how I feel. I'm gonna put a couple of links down below to some GoFundMe pages that the family have set up and one of them, if you are actually in the area, they're raising money to host Newport's first annual gay pride gathering and that's gonna be held on, Oct on um, excuse me, April, 3rd, 2021, which would have been Jason's 20th birthday. So if you're in the area of Newport, Washington, and you have the time, I think that that would be great for you to go out. There's power in numbers, and I feel like it would be nice for the family to see how much support they have behind them. If I was in the area, I would go. So if you are in the area, I would suggest going. That would be cool, or at least you can donate. The links again will be down below. But anyways, guys, that completes this video. Thank you for watching it. I hope it was interesting and informative and gave you all the information that you'd want on this case, at least now, based on what we have. 
And I hope you, of course, enjoyed watching it. I want you to enjoy what I'm putting out into the world. That's why I'm putting it out, is to inform you and, you know, duh. And of course, I also just want to thank you for remembering Jason with me today, hanging out, spending some time, hearing about who he was as a person and who he was to the people he cared about. It's just so sad because it seems like he just had a lot of promise and he just kind of was going down a bad path. You see that happen and we'll never know if he would have gotten the opportunity to fix this, if he would have gone on to be a nurse and done a lot of great things. You just don't know because some assholes made it impossible and took him from the earth forever. And I just, it's so sad. And I just really hope that with a trial that is upcoming, we will get justice for Jason. Please let me know of any cases you would like to see down below. Again, thank you, Kristen, for suggesting this one. As, as I've said many times, if you leave a case suggestion, I add it to my list with your name next to it so I can give you a shout out. I want to hear what cases you suggest because I know you're filled with good taste and good ideas. Otherwise, you would not be here. Please, of course, join the Brad Pack by subscribing and ringing the bell because I put out a new morbid makeup video every single week and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically, you. And if you want to hang out more consistently, you can follow me on my other social media. I have Instagram and Twitter. They're both Bradderstein. And I also have a Facebook page and a Facebook group. The page is Bradderstein and the group is Morbid Makeup True Crime. So if you want to hang out there, sometimes you get sneak peeks. Sometimes you get to know what video I'm going to be putting out and you get the first announcements for things like bonus videos. So those are there for, for your viewing pleasure. <laughs> but with all of that said, I just want to thank you for being here when you could literally be anywhere else in the world. That's tight. You're tight. Please stay safe and be better than you were yesterday. And I hope to see you in my next video.